burden very big to the stage. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, it's nice to see a, a nice full hall here. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to come here. It's my first time not only in Perth but in Western Australia. So it's been a tremendous education in the last um, 12 hours that I've been here. Um, I'm going to be speaking to you about uh, the Sustainable Development Goals, but I think I'll first respond um, very quickly to what our colleague has just said just now. I think of, of, of many of the things that we've learned over the last few years about sustainability, especially urban sustainability, uh, what our indigenous people actually bring to us is, is very deep and important. What we learned uh, when looking at long-range challenges over you know, a period of time in the early uh, starting the early 90s, and this is across four different regions of the world, is that we have to, in some senses, invert uh, the historical process of city building. Uh, what we've typically done over the last couple of thousands of years is really situate cities like Perth in places where, in some senses, there were not too many people. Uh, and then we've drawn into those cities, whether it's Roman times and otherwise, resources and used them. Uh, basically, uh, you know, we, we try and control the landscape, the ecosystems, and they feed the city. But the world today is not what it was when urbanism started maybe 5,000 years ago, and you know, we've crashed cities more often than, than, than not. Uh, the world is now a very full place. Uh, the world today is, is much fuller of, of people than it was uh, even at the beginning of the 20th century. At the beginning of the 20th century, we had about a billion plus people. We are, we're going to be at seven and going up to nine billion. So in a world that's full of people, we cannot actually manage and maintain the earlier paradigm of building cities that actually drew on the landscape. In fact, the most difficult thing that we, we, we try and do with educators is actually in, in completely invert the process. And that is the key thing to design for, if you were to, able to design in the first place, is the ecosystem services. So you have to design the region and the processes and actually live off what the region can provide you. And in the interstitial spaces uh, is where the human settlements can actually come. And that's, a, in some senses, an inversion of what we've learned and done for, in some cases, in this part of the world, maybe 250 years, but in my part of the world, maybe for the last 1,000, 1,500 years. So there's a fundamental shift. And, and that shift, I think, has to be integrated not only in our, into our practice, but centrally into our education, because all the technologies, much of the social systems, and our practices of consumption and production are driven by an imagination of a world that does not exist anymore. It's a world that's full which we're having dramatic impact on our environment. So, you know, uh, I think that, that that was a wonderful uh, reflection of wisdom that we've heard. It's, it's going to be very difficult for us to do that because pretty much everything we do on an everyday basis does not speak to that understanding of the relationship between human beings uh, and, uh, and the planet and the environment. I mean, you know, we, we have to really, in some ways, act uh, as if the universe were living and we were part of it. And if you see the universe uh, as living, uh, and in some, in some cases as a sacred landscape, uh, then I guess the way one engages with that, with that practice is somewhat different. So I mean, that, that, that I think is sort of my quick response. Uh, India is a very old culture, but probably not 40,000 years old. At least we can't, we can't trace things back that far. But um, I think that that's a very important gift that you've given us. So I'm going to run through very, very quickly, um, or at least open up a dialogue with some of you, because what I've learned in the last, um, let's say, half a day in Perth, is that you have a very particular culture here, uh, which is quite special. And even though you're at the edge of one part of the world, uh, a lot more people have to actually hear your voices and to share your experiences. Uh, and I, I think one of the most important things is the relationship between citizen and the city, uh, the city and the region, and the region, and of course, in this case, uh, the Commonwealth or, or, or the Federation. Uh, and that's one of the core challenges that we're, we're dealing with at the moment. Uh, not only um, you know, in your part of the world, but pretty much everywhere else. Because the imagination of where cities are is actually fundamentally shifting. So, um, whoops. Okay, so I guess, uh, you know, this has been a debate for a long, long time. And if you look at processes that have taken place over the last 40 years or so, we had a very major international conference in Vancouver in 1976, Habitat One. We're about to have the 40-year reprise of that uh, in Quito uh, at the end of the year. And I guess the central question uh, that, that sits behind 
the dialogue that we've been having for the last many years are, you know, our city is really important. And given that the world um, has historically either looked at cities as places which are full of conflict, sin, poverty, and stuff like that, and of course in many parts of the world, especially the, the parts of the world that, that I come from in Asia, uh, most people actually live in rural areas. There's a big question mark about the role of the city. Uh, and of course, uh, it's, it's, it's sort of, you know, it's progression in the, in the larger framework of sustainability. And in many cases, the whole range of people who work on sustainability sees, see cities in some senses as uh, sort of as an antithesis of what sustainability should be like. Uh, there's been a big pushback on that question. So I think this is the sort of core question, are cities important? And let me give you a little bit of a historical perspective. That's a quick map of the world in 1950. What you're seeing at the top there are two numbers. One is the world population in cities at that time, uh, which was something of the order of uh, 0.75 billion, just, just, just after the war. Uh, and, the, and the global economy, uh, at least the global city economy, was just $3 trillion in size. I mean, this is, a, this is a more or less in current prices. And you can see um, you know, where, where the cities were located at that point of time. We're here, you can just see a fairly faint dot there. Of course, largely North America and Europe, the old urban civilizations, China and Japan coming back. In some senses, something's happening in South Asia. Now, if I jump forward uh, another 60 years, you can see this, this, this dramatic shift that's taking place. And you can see that, of course, in the NASA uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, night lights. So a massive explosion uh, in many parts of the world, primarily in Latin America, North America, and some densification in Europe, and a build out in many other parts of the world. So that, that's a period of 60 years. The most important thing, of course, is not only the growth of the number of cities or the growth of the population, it really is that economic number. And this is something that people don't necessarily sort of cognize. We think of ourselves as an urban planet because in 2007, 8, depending on where you actually count it, about half the population of the world lived in urban areas. But actually, the urban economy, uh, the, the global economy became half urban uh, somewhere in the late 1980s, early 1990s. That's a shift that nobody actually saw. And in some senses, Perth um, is you know, has reaped the benefits of that process, a process of globalization and a rapid growth of, of, of the urban economy. So that is a number to watch. And if I, if I take you forward to 2030, uh, the surprising number, of course, is not 5 billion. 5 billion is a huge number. Many, many more people than, you know, what we had when, I guess, maybe some of us were born. The really interesting number is the one on the right-hand side. We expect the, the sort of the, 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 the global urban output to go up to about 90 trillion. So we're living in an exceptional age. Cities are producing, uh, on an average, about somewhere between, depending on a good or bad year, between a, 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 billion, a trillion to a trillion and a half uh, dollars a year. That's the tremendous value addition that cities uh, bring. So when Jeff, Jeff talked to you last year, he talked to you about the sustainable development goals and where it would come. The only reason that we can, in some senses, talk about the end of poverty and dealing with all the infrastructure and services that would bring a lot of the people in the world, at least to a basic level of income or a basic level of services, is because of the tremendous productivity that we've seen. So it's this, this tremendous growth of wealth that cities have driven. And, and this is, in some senses, both the opportunity and also the challenge. Because it is this tremendous amount of consumption and production that's also creating some of the most serious environmental challenges that we have. And climate uh, you know, is only one of them. Climate is only one of the serious global environmental challenges we have. Uh, it's taken the forefront and it's quite important, but there are others that we're dealing with. So this, and you, know, you can see, as I said, if I flip you through this quick sequence here that's there from 1950 to 2030, this is the expansion that we're having. And, and I guess the important thing for yourselves, I mean, apart from sort of Perth emerging in, in this region, is the fact that the bulk of the most, most important urbanization that will take place is happening uh, within four to six flying hours of being here. So you are pretty much at the epicenter of the process, uh, which uh, most European cities would have been uh, 50 or 100 years ago. So in, in some senses, you're in a very, very strategic location. And I think, you know, one has to think in, in terms of both geography and, and politics in this process. This is a quick map of the largest cities in the world. This is from UN Pop Division uh, in 2025. And the browns are all Asian cities. And you can see here that there's not a single Australian city uh, in, in that set, fine. Tokyo is obviously the largest conurbation in the world. Delhi comes as number two. And these are conservative estimates. So New York City is sitting there as, as, at, at, at number six. Los Angeles is there, Chicago is down here. And that's where London and Paris actually sit. And this is, this is pretty, pretty much certain to happen. 
in, in less, than, less than nine years time. This is the demographics actually playing itself out. So you're seeing not only a tremendous shift in terms of scope, but you're seeing a shift in the center of geography and in some ways, and that, that's what we were talking about before this, um, you are very closely allied to this process. So I guess the question we have is, you know, our city is important, yes, maybe, uh, but the most dramatic question that we have to address today is, can cities actually enable this dramatic change that we need to see in less than a generation or maybe even, even in a generation so that we're able to realize the benefits of a whole range of things that have happened across the world, improvements in technology, and economic development, etc. Um, and of course, again, you're not too far from the example. The classic example is here. This is Shanghai, uh, before Deng Xiaoping made that famous journey of his uh, that's going looking from Pushi to Pudong. And those of you who've been to the city, uh, that's, that's a dramatic, dramatic change that you actually have. I mean, you know, it's, it's stunning. I've been going back to Shang Shanghai for a number of years. Uh, and this is, this is a classic example. And this happens in many places. I guess, you know, even Perth maybe went through a small, very small version of this during the boom era, I guess, of, of the Gorash uh, about 100 plus years ago. This is, this is what happens to cities in some senses. But this is now happening at global scale. This is capital uh, and a whole range of other processes. Just look at that transformation. Uh, in, less than a, in less than a generation. So this is absolutely possible. But the question, of course, that's sitting behind this is not that the fabric has changed and there's so much wealth and, you know, this is suddenly looking very developed. The question is uh, in the imagination. And, you know, you know in, in some, some ways, and I talk to Chinese colleagues about this all the time, uh, and that is, is this imaginary, the imaginary that you really want to, to use? New York is a wonderful city. I spent a lot of time there. Uh, the UN is based out of there, et cetera, et cetera. But I guess the key question that we have is, is this where in the 21st century we're actually going to land up? And New York has done some remarkable things in the last um, five to 10 years, both in the Bloomberg administration and with Bill uh, de Blasio, the new mayor who I, I know a little bit. Uh, but the question, I guess, for both Australia and for the rest of our world is, and, and Shanghai is an example of this, is this kind of urbanization actually sustainable? Can this actually work? Not only for the city of New York, can it work for the larger system because we are part of a larger, uh, larger system. That, that's, that's what we're trying to address here. So when we were trying to answer this question, in some senses, most of the countries of the world, when we started this journey in 2013, basically said, forget it. Cities cannot be part of a sustainable agenda, you know, sustainable agenda. And, they, and there were three or four reasons for this. The first one is that they're too complex. Bureaucrats and governments do not like dealing with high levels of complexity. They like to have things in little boxes that can be broken down and dealt with in files and, and managed. So they're obviously too complex. They're the largest and most complex processes and systems that have been built in all of human history. And you know, if you look at history critically, we've crashed cities more often than they've actually sort of helped us. The second thing, of course, is that we cannot implement sustainability in urban areas. Why? Because if you do something in one place around employment, you, you have a problem as far as land. And if you have a problem about land, then you have something else that's happening in transport. So things are popping up all the time. So in, 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 in systems where you're trying to break things down into small baskets, and actually deal with them sectorally, it's almost impossible to implement it. So they said, okay, we can do this stuff nationally, we cannot do this uh, as far as cities are concerned. And then of course, um, the politics of the process, especially because the United Nations has people from all over the world, many countries that are still rural, they said, look, if we give you an urban goal that looks at urban sustainability, we'll have to create a separate goal for rural areas, and that'll mean that there will be mission creep and we'll have too many goals. Uh, and, and finally, of course, and the real reasons for all this, and that's, that's why I thought I'd provoke you on this question, is that urban sustainability at its heart means devolution of power and resources to local governments. And I would say, at least within the Western European context, and you know, in some sense Australia is an extension of that, uh, ever since Napoleon, uh, the history of, of European, and hence you know, European-derived urbanization has been about centralization. That's exactly what Napoleon did. Napoleon centralized the process. Earlier, uh, cities after the Black Death and in the Middle Ages in Europe were very uh, were largely autonomous places. They had much greater degrees of autonomy. But there was a process of centralization. And even if you look at France today, France actually has a clear division between urban and rural areas. So he took away power from the cities and actually in instituted it in the, in the state. And then we reproduced that across the world. Um, in, in, you know, in the colonial empires, uh, in, in the extension of that process, 
Uh, and, and that in, in, a, in a sense is a structure of governance that we have today where national governments decide and run processes but autonomy at the local level is not the political settlement that underlie most constitutions. I mean I'm trained in law so I, I look at some of these questions in, in comparative law terms and I guess th that's one of the questions that you should be asking about the Australian constitution and how you actually structure it. Do you have a high degree of autonomy uh, in your municipalities to do what they need to do. Can they raise their own taxes? Can they do what they need to do? And I think that is, that is a big challenge because we now have to deal with 5 billion people. The question of course is, can you deal with 5 billion people just using 193 entities? In fact, actually there are about 50 of them that really matter in the world. The other ones are actually quite small. Um, can we actually manage and govern 5 billion people with just, let's say, under 100 entities that, to manage them? And I guess the answer often is that it's almost impossible to do that. Because you cannot deal with local challenges, you cannot deal with local co context, you can't deal with cultural and other political issues. Uh, and hence, both from the governance point of view and cybernetically, it's almost impossible to do that. So the real reason that uh, for the last 40 years we didn't actually have something within the global development frame and within the national governance frame in many cases that focused on cities was really a question of power. And what we're contesting today, and we're contesting this upwards by mobilizing mayors and citizens across the world, is the question of how power will devolve and how our resources and our futures will be managed. That's, that's a real battle. Uh, and it's sort of reimagining um, the, the, the political settlement that started in the first and, and culminated in the Second World War that was centered around uh, the nation state. So this is what we've been playing at for the last uh, two and a half, three years or so. A standalone go goal for urban sustainability. Uh, and in some senses, uh, this, is, this is rather special because if you look at the, the 17 goals, there are a whole range of them. I, I won't go into detail with them just now. But basically, there are three clusters of goals. The first one is what I call 19th century goals, dealing with poverty, hunger, etc. These are old goals from the 1850s. If you were along with Marx and Engels or the Paris Commune, you heard the same stories. And you hear that in, in many parts of the develop, developed world. Then there are 20th century goals, which, which we see in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Um, you know, a whole range of core rights around education, healthcare, uh, equality, etc. And then there are two sets of goals that were most contested in this debate that lasted a year and a half on, in the UN. One is about climate, which we just about managed to deal with by the skin of our teeth in Paris uh, last December. And the other one was cities, which I think by, by accident or by design we were able to pull off uh, through a complex series of negotiations. So basically, how did it happen? It happened because by accident and process, we were able to mobilize politically uh, over a fairly short period uh, about 200 cities and regional governments. Um, Australia was part of that process, um, both Melbourne and Sydney, the, the Lord Mayors were involved in the, in the engagement. We were able to mobilize them to actually speak to the member states. The United Nations is a club in some senses uh, of, of a number of different countries. And essentially, the countries talk to themselves and everybody else is outside the room and looking inwards. We were able to inject into that process a process of deliberation, mobilization from both the citizen's point of view and certainly from the point of view of mayors. And in, in, in the world of the internet, in the world in which, you know, our past 2008, the voices of many people are heard and young people take to the streets, this was something that did influence the process. People saw this as a positive opportunity. Uh, these are the major groups that actually came together, the major urban groups for the first time in 40 years actually came together and stood together and we've been doing that now for the last couple of years and seeing again as things move forward to Quito uh, in October a, a stronger mobilization. Uh, so lots of debate, that's, that's me in the UN. This was what we were looking for, this was the framing that we used because things have to be succinct and, and relatively clear. So basically the idea was make cities and human settlements. I mean human settlements seems like a you know, cranky sort of 1970s word. But it's an important word in some countries because it, 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 it denotes towns and villages. And you know, in my country, there are 640,000 villages. Fine, so that's a lot of people in a lot of places. So you can't both politically and otherwise sort of neglect that. And then we had, you know, uh, five basic words, inclusive, safe, productive, resilience, and sustainable that we put into it. This is a major campaign that we ran. And this went on for a year and a half. That was us in the UN. And at the end of it, this is what we got. A little bit mixed up, you know, when you, when you in, in large scale political negotiations, any, any, anybody who does that, both at council level and otherwise, what you want to get and what is academically interesting and useful, we were, look, we were looking for 10, we got 17, fine, because it's, it's a process of compromise. Uh, but within that, goal 11 uh, focused on, on sustainable communities, but there were two things that were very interesting there. 
the first thing that one must understand was that unlike the processes that started in 99, 2000 with uh, the previous Secretary General Kofi Annan, which were called the Millennium Development Goals, ending poverty, dealing with hunger, etc., which were focused on poor people in poor countries. This is the first time since 1948 that all the member states of the United Nations actually came together and said, we're all stepping up together. And you should have heard them. They, you know, they, I, I was in the, in the General Assembly when, when this happened, opened by, by Pope Francis, uh, and then going on. Uh, you know, Prime ministers, presidents, one after the other, saying this is really something that we have to do. Partially because of political pressure, partially because it's nice to talk about. Uh, but for the first time, we now have a universal global development agenda. It's not about poor people in poor countries or poor people in rich countries. It's about everybody everywhere. And this is very interesting, how this actual turn of events actually took place. And it, it was not without contest. Some of these goals were contested deeply on the floor of, of, of the House, including some of them around human rights, because some of the new sort of post-Second World War countries that were decolonized were basically saying, you people settled this deal in 1948. These are your ideas of human rights. These do not correspond to our cultures. So it wasn't that it, it happened without, 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 without contest, but it did happen. And then there was another very interesting thing. You're not only saying that this is about everybody everywhere, but there's another very interesting throwaway line there, which says that no one is to be left behind. Now, those of us who actually help manage processes know that it's difficult enough to do something in a complex world, whether it's providing water or helping education or helping deal with healthcare or you know, passing a new legislation. To do that for everybody, which means that you recognize vulnerability, you recognize difference, you recognize that every citizen is important, is a huge political statement. Now, this is not justiciable, because none of these things, you know, we don't have international law that can force a government to do this. But the fact that there's a commitment to not leaving anybody behind is a huge deal if the national governments actually agree to do this stuff. I mean, it's one thing to say that you do it, another thing to do it. We understand that's the nature of politics, right? Uh, but these two things actually provide us a very interesting platform to engage with a new kind of politics because, you know, the world is not the same as it was even 15 years ago when the wall came down or 20 years ago when the wall came down in Berlin. Uh, we are deeply connected. We have a very large global population of young people who see themselves, many of them, as global citizens who are willing to actually engage. They're actually involved in processes which would normally take place. So this is what the goals are like. I'm not going to sort of deal with them uh, in too much detail, excepting maybe I should do it here really quickly. Number one, uh, end poverty. Number two, end hunger. Number three, universal health. Number four, uh, universal education. Number five, this was, a, this was a tough one, but it actually went through very strongly because of Latin America. Gender equality. Number six, clean water and sanitation. Number seven, renewable energy. Number eight, jobs and economic growth. This is a central one, actually. Uh, we lost the battle on this because jobs was meant to be part of cities and we lost that, that, that debate. Uh, then the number nine is on infrastructure, number 10 is on inequality. This was the most deeply fought one. In fact, we, the negotiations almost broke down in the last three days, going till four o'clock at night and a day over time on the question of inequality. And then responsible consumption as number 12, climate as number 13, very vaguely stated because we were not sure what would actually happen in Paris. Uh, 14 and 15 are the environmental goals. This is uh, um, water and, and, and land. Uh, terrestrial and aqu aquatic and marine systems, peace and justice at 16, uh, and 17, partnership. Now, 17 is very interesting. Partnership normally doesn't mean anything in UN terms. But in, in the current context, it's become actually quite political. Because what we're saying is that you cannot actually achieve these goals unless there's an effective partnership between local processes, regional processes, and national processes, or in, in, in government speak, between national government, federal government, state or provincial governments, and local governments. And this is, I would say, in the next 15 years, going to actually inject, in some parts of the world at least, a fundamental reworking of how politics is actually played. Um, and in, in a sense, people have signed up to this agenda without fully understanding what it will mean in terms of uh, where they're going to be going. So how does it look like? So the question is, you know, this is all fancy stuff, lots of numbers. I'll just, I'll just show you, a, this is a quick thing and I'll show you. This is Sweden which sits, this is an index that you know, we put together. Some of you may be familiar with the Human Development Index that does this kind of stuff. So this is Sweden, uh, which notionally is number one in, in the overall thing. So basically the idea is that in, by 2030, everybody should reach 100. Huh? This is a very simplex, simplistic rendition. There are 17 goals that are about 175 targets. It's a com completely confused 
uh, for the average layperson a range of processes because everybody in every sector wanted their things into the process. So we've got all sort of things. So this is the visual representation. So you have the goals here from uh, 1 all the way up to 17 uh, clockwise. And I've just put in a few indicators here to give you a sense of what this actually means. So when I look at Sweden, you're saying, okay, Sweden is number one in the world, top ranking country with an STI of 87, which basically means that, you know, in 15 years time, it should be fairly easy to Sweden to make up stuff that takes it to 100, fine. Uh, but there are important other indicators here. On the top left hand side here, uh, we have the GDP per capita for Sweden. Uh, this is in PPP terms, this is not nominal terms, fine, so it's adjusted. Uh, number 23rd, so things in brackets are the, the global rank. So Sweden is the number third, 23rd economies in the world, about 45, 46,000 dollars, etc. This is a human development index, 0.91. Okay, slightly lower than Australia. Australia has been doing remarkably well in that space. There's so many people who go to university here, which is fantastic. Uh, and of course, the population of Sweden, which is 10 million, about slightly less than you know, half, half of what the Australian population is like, number 88 in the world. This is a very important thing for us to look at. This is, the, this is the bio capacity. This is taking the ecological footprint, looking at the amount of bio capacity there, there is. If it's positive, it means that the overall bio capacity is larger than the ecological demand. But in most parts of the world, because we're in a global eco ecological deficit, this is a negative number, fine? Okay, so that's, I'll just take you through a few countries to get a sense of how this is useful. It may seem like a very complex jumble of a whole range of things, but when you look, look at it com in, comparat uh, in a comparative perspective, you actually get some. So that's Sweden, that's Germany. So Germany, number 21 on GDP, number seven on the STI index and HDI number six. Look at Germany's biocapacity, okay? It's gone, it's gone negative, fine? So basically, Germans consume much more ecological resources uh, than the, 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 you know, what their territory can actually provide you. And of course, it's a population of 83 million. You can see some interesting trends here, for example. Look at this here. So Germany is actually doing not, not so well on the climate side, in spite of the fact that you know, Germany has a lot of renewables at the moment because the historical consumption of energy is quite high. It's a quite energy intense economy. And in a whole range of other things also, it's not on its on terrestrial uh, ecosystems is not, not, not doing so well. And even on cities, there are, there are a whole range of challenges they have. So, okay, that's Germany, that's the UK. Okay, number nine. Uh, again, negative biocapacity, fine. Population about 63 million, HDI 0.9, roughly the same. These are all OECD countries. You can see where the numbers are. So in some senses, you know, and, and these are, you know, these are just games in some senses because uh, these numbers are based on indicators. How you choose the indicators will change things. That's France much more balanced in some senses, but still negative bio, bio capacity uh, and be much better on some things than others. Uh, on, on, the, on the climate side, for example, France is better than the UK uh, because of the way things are counted. They have a lot of nuclear power, which is a big question as far as some people are concerned. That's New Zealand. Okay, so I'll just take you through. So that's France, that's New Zealand, and that's where you are. Okay, so you, the, the Pac-Man image there is because of the wonderful things that you do with your environment especially as far as climate is concerned. I'm hoping that, you know, given that you're know, the global sort of capital of, of innovation as far as solar is concerned, that's going to change very quickly. So again, on, on, on some things you're doing quite well, at least the indicators that we're doing on, on cities, uh, on a whole range of things on, on consumption, uh, maybe not so, no, not, not so well on, on, on others. So um, again, the, the beautiful thing about Australia again is the amount of, I mean, you know, you're a continental size island. You have a tremendous amount of natural resources. Look at the difference between yourselves. That's, that's the United States. Fine. So when I show this to people, the interesting thing of course is, and this, this is I think the, the tipping point that happened within the UN process. It's not only the fact that it's, we're trying to deal with the development framework that deals with everybody everywhere, but the realization that this is not a North-South problem. It's not an OECD versus the rest of the world problem. In actual fact, because of the way the world economy is currently constructed, we are all developing countries in something or the other. There is something to be done in every part of the world to deal with our own issues. And of course, in other, some parts of the world it's, it's really bad and we'll be coming to the rest of the world just now. But I mean, just, just in the set that you saw just now, okay, just very quickly, so that's Sweden, sort of the paradise of sustainability in some senses, Germany, the UK, France, New Zealand, Australia, the US, seriously challenged, and we know all the challenges, inequality, climate, I mean, all the things that that sort of the United States also stands for in some senses. In fact, in spite of the fact that it's, you know, it's, it's, a it's, a, it's the second largest economy in the world, that's Japan. Some serious challenges, and we know, I mean, Japan has had this breakout culture for a long time because of, because of these challenges. These are, these are sort of geopolitical challenges. That's Singapore, okay? In the morning I was speaking about the fact that 
Perth in some senses could be a very interesting example for people in East, East Asia and probably much better than Singapore in some sense. Singapore is a fantastic place, but it's very, very particular. It's a singularity in some senses. That's Russia. Okay. Russia has many challenges apart from the GDP, etc. It's, it's human development number 45. Yeah, fine. Uh, biocapacity, you know, the, the largest country in the world, huge amount of, of land resources, but still in terms of biocapacity, uh, from the Soviet times on onwards, Russia has been having some challenges. That's Brazil. Again, tremendous amount of resources, positive biocapacity, but many other challenges, including inequality. Uh, doing very well on a whole range of things, but you know, and uh, that's Thailand, 99 or number six, 62 on the STI index of 0.5, 70 million people. That's Indonesia. So you know, you can see the size of the. I mean, the thing is not the actual numbers themselves, but the pattern that you're able to see. You can see the pie, I mean, the, the pie by actually being being smaller. That's China, largest economy in the world. 1.4 billion people, huge challenges of course, you know, it's, 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 a, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful country to be in at this current point of time because it's transforming itself in many ways, but seriously challenging a whole range of things and serious biocapacity problems. We were talking about Chinese uh, building our, you know, trying to buy out land in many parts of Australia. There's pretty good reason for that, uh, as, as you will find in other parts of the world. That's the Philippines, that's South Africa. There are many people from South Africa, I believe in Perth. South Africa has, has many serious challenges. That's my own poor country, the country that has the largest population of poor people in the world, more than 350 million people who are really poor. And as an extreme example, I just picked up Rwanda just from, you know, whatever. I, so basically what I'm showing you is that there's a framework. It has its limitations. The indicators are not perfect. There are too many of them. You know, it can be very confusing. But a comparative perspective does show you Actually, that there are there changes and there are differences, and you can start thinking about these things. What can I improve? How can I make things different? What synergies are there between water and health, between uh, gender and employment? You can start looking at the connection between these things. They provide us at least, uh, you know, a way, way way to start th steering through the process there. But you have to look at at, at you know the, the three other bigger big big pillars: the economy, uh, how you're doing as far as society is concerned, and of course the environment. And these are only indicators. They're only indicative of where we we are. So. The question is, and this is a really surprising thing, when, you, when we look at back, look at back at this almost six months later, you know, sometimes we wonder whether the UN actually agreed to do what the UN agreed to do. Because most national governments would not agree to do that in, you know, in, in, in most political areas. So what, what did they agree to do? This is what they did as far as the urban goal is concerned, excepting they struck the word productive out. So the linkage between cities and employment and productivity was actually broken in the negotiations. It went to industrialization. So this is a big challenge that we're having in the global discourse at the moment. We're trying to bring back into the imagination of cities the idea that cities actually create tremendous amount of economic opportunity and potential. We know that, I mean, absolutely for sure. But because of the current paradigm, which is speaking of industrialization as a core driver, infrastructure as a driver, driven, of course, by Asian uh, sort of industrialization, that became a critical thing there. The other, th the other structural problem that we have is, is, is two things. The first thing is a deep ambiguity on where all this money is going to come from. So we agreed to do all this wonderful stuff. But actually, there's no money to do this. Yeah? At least the money is not committed, and the UN, of course, is not an agency that does this kind of stuff. UN is, the UN is, in a sense, like I said, a club. Fine? So where is this money going to come from is a very critical question. It will obviously come from national governments, but then we know the kind of resources that are required to do this stuff uh, may not be only with, within the purview of the national governments to enable. So one of the big differences in this big debate that we've seen especially after the 2008 crisis, is that the enterprise sector, for the first time, is very much a part of this discussion. Even though they may be not out there in the front, but sitting behind most national governments are the question of jobs and the question of large enterprises. And small ones, of course, the informal sector has come back in some senses. So the question of resourcing is very critical. The second thing, of course, that's very important to understand is the responsibility of territorial development is very weak. And what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is the imagination of how all of these fancy things will be achieved, these great goals, is driven by, to characterize it, that Napoleonic schema of government, where everything is broken up into departments and into sectors. It has no spatial imagination. Of all those 17 goals, the only place where a spatial imagination exists is in goal 11. So in fact, the odd thing that's happened is we don't have a rural goal. But the responsibility of dealing with rural development, in a sense, has come to the urban goal in some senses, because we're thinking territorially. So this is a paradigm conflict in some senses that we're going to be dealing with over the next 15 years. How do you integrate the imagination of space 
into ideas of inequality, into ideas of development, into ideas of, of, of growth and economic process. So what does it actually mean in practice? At a global level, it means, this is what the governments have signed up to. We said it's a little bit crazy. 600 million new jobs by 2030. Okay? Fine. So you divide 600 by 15 and you get a pretty big number on an annual basis. Obviously, it'll devolve in different places. It means providing safe, adequate, and well-serviced housing and basic services to between one and two billion people, depending on how you count them. And of course, governments like to count things the way that they like to count it. But this is the scale of what we're talking about. This is what we've signed up to. It, of course, means providing secure and inclusive built environment and universal access to green public spaces across the world. This is an example from, you know, you can have it, in, I'm sure we've, I would have taken some photographs from this morning. This is from, from London. It means sustainable water supply and universal access to environmental services, again, for about two billion people. It means secure regional food systems and sustainable agriculture. This is an image from Vancouver, one of my favorite cities, uh, along with other Australian ones. It means sustainable and accessible transportation for all the people who live in urban, urban areas. Uh, and I think, you know, we, you're a wonderful example of, of trying to do this. Uh, it also means sustainable uh, and reliable energy systems and clean manufacturing. And I'm taking an example from Copenhagen. But in some senses, if Australia were to step up uh, on the manufacturing front, this is, some, this is the place that you could actually go. Uh, it means the deployment of disruptive technologies for the first time, uh, the availability of broadband telecommunications is sort of integrated into this framework of development. And then you have different examples of this in different parts of the world. That's the Singapore example, the one that you're most, you know, most talked about in some parts of Asia. You saw the challenges Singapore has in the overall index. Another view of it, this is from Porto Alegre in Brazil. Brazil has a very different way of actually getting around this challenge. Brazil many years ago actually made a commitment to the right of the city. It has a statue of the city. There's a whole process that enables this. Uh, or there's the most remarkable urbanization in all of human history, uh, which China has enabled, which has not only urbanized China, but it's also brought the largest population of poor people out of poverty uh, in, in less than a generation. So there are many different examples in different places. And I've just shown you three of them. Uh, but I think we need to be able to find our iconic examples, our things that work for us in our particular environments cultural, political, and social. And that's, that's a big challenge for us. So these seem like big global things, but in actual fact, they're built drop by drop or brick by brick from local community upwards. But our frame of governance, at least the larger frame of governance as we have it today, does not necessarily allow for those imaginations. So those part of the world that actually have ability to do this through deliberative democracy by a whole range of other processes are very important to us because the rest of us whether it is learning from indigenous people or otherwise, have to learn how to do that most effectively. So how can we move forward? The first thing, of course, is to recognize that for the countries to do this, they really have to build an effective strategic and operational partnership with cities and regions. Okay? It's impossible to achieve all these things that we were talking about, that involve trillion dollars, trillions of dollars of resources and a rejigging of government without, without doing this. The second thing, of course, is to recognize the opportunity that it provides to not only strengthen the economies of, we call the member states, of the countries, but also society and polity. By being able to devolve and partner, you're actually strengthening your processes and not weakening it. We're not in the 17th and the 18th century. This is not the era of the divine right of whatever it is, of, of national capitals to design, design things. We're living in a different era today. Uh, we have to open an urban implementation for process, focus not only uh, with governments, but also with economic enterprises. It's quite important. We have to change the imagination of people at the highest levels, including the G20. We're trying to do that in the next G20 meeting in, 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 um, in, in China, and of course, trying to influence the World Economic Forum to think differently. The hidden question, of course, is that we have to build a new architecture, and I've used an acronym there, for financing development. Because at the moment, most development is financed either by national government with some flows that come in from local governments, but centrally, uh, especially in the north-south, earlier north-south imagination, through the flow, to, uh, flow of development aid. Development aid will not be able to do a thing as far as this process is concerned. For some countries which are very small, small island states, some parts of Africa which are, are really deeply challenged, some amount of those resources will make a critical difference. But in terms of the changes we're talking about, development aid is not going to be able to finance even a fraction of what we need to do. And then, of course, uh, we have to recognize local governments and communities. And the SDG Summit actually laid that out quite clearly. 
Uh, we, ha we have a very strong role of cities that emerged during the Paris COP. This was another very interesting mobilization that happened from below. Mayors became very central to the process that was there. And then finally, we have to establish a global geospatial infrastructure. And this is where universities are very important, apart from knowledge creation and innovation around monitoring and evaluation. We have to know where we're going and how fast we're going. Remember, we have 15 years to achieve this. So even if there's an overhang by a couple of years here and there, we have to know what we are not doing and where we're not doing that. Because unless that feedback actually works, uh, both politically and operationally, uh, especially in democratic societies, which is maybe only half the world's population, uh, we won't actually be able to make the right choices in time. So this is the point that I made both to mayors and, and to political leaders across the country. This is fundamentally the urban goal and the process that we're dealing with is about providing 600 million plus local jobs and the provision of public goods and services. So this is the everyday business of governance and politics, which is good across the world, whether you're struggling in the European Union or even the US is having, you know, struggling at the moment in spite of, of the Federal Reserve doing what it's done over the last many years up to 2008. Australia is in some senses better off than many other parts of the world. China is even struggling at the current point of time. Chinese growth rate is going, is going to go below 7% this year, uh, et cetera. So this is fundamentally about creating opportunities, especially for young people. Remember, we're going to add a billion and a half people to the planet. And in many parts of the world, like in my country, the average population, I mean, the average age is, is under 26 or 27. Yeah, so this, this is the core question. So when you are actually putting in resources into public goods and services and creating these jobs, it's good for the economy, it's good for politics, and it's good for devolution. It's also about, and this is, this is the thing that people don't really get, it's a multi-trillion dollar opportunity on urban infrastructure, uh, on urban housing. Uh, so it's, it's, it's really an immense opportunity. And this cannot be done by federal governments alone. The resources have to be raised from a whole range of places. We're talking about large movements of capital, not only within, within countries, but across countries that make this kind of process possible. We have to think not only about a local architecture, to enable the funding of, let's say, your CAT bus system by parking, parking fees, which was a great and pleasant surprise to me. We don't have that, it doesn't work in India very well. Uh, but also the, the, the flow of capital that's required to actually build and renew cities, which may not be available within national governments. You know, the largest pool of capital in the world sits in East Asia at the moment, and it's starting to move out. That's what the Asian Infrastructure Development Bank is all about. That's what the New Development Bank is about. There's a, there's a complete rework of the global financial architecture. So this is not only about local devolution, it's also about the simultaneous change in the global financial architecture. And they're tied to each other. And I think, you know, as a service sector led economy, it's important for, for Australia to do that. But I think in, in political terms, the most important thing that we're trying to deal with is, and, and I use the word carefully here, it's got a G and an L in it. It's both global and local partnerships. And you know, the way that we've tried to sell it is it cannot be done by 200 countries alone. We require at least 2,000, I would say five, but you know, to even mobilize 2,000 uh, local governments and, and, and cities across the world is a huge task. We can probably reach out to maybe 500 or 1,000 with all the network networks that we have. We have to mobilize them and make sure the technology, the practice for management, you know, day-to-day -day things like water and sanitation and healthcare actually work in a sustainable manner. It's, it's, it's about everyday processes. And these imply new political governance and fiscal arrangements. These are hard questions. These are not simple questions. Anybody who's served in a city council or who's been a member of parliament will know them. These are, these are hard questions to deal with. So there are at least eight different groups of people who actually will have to work together. And that's why it's so interesting. It's not only about a global compact. It's really about building the relationship between all these actors. And knowledge institutions and universities are very central to this process because the repository of a lot of global practices and knowledge lies with us. The, 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 the sort of the responsibility of educating a new generation and creating entrepreneurs and change makers lies with us. So we have a very important role in accelerating learning. And we have potential to do that because of, of the way that you know, technology is, is working. And three things to be done. The first, in many places at least, getting the land and property markets right because that's where our, most of your capitalization lies. The reason that you have a you know, really odd sprawl in many parts of the world is because we, our land markets do not work for the bulk of the citizens. They only work with certain kinds of people. The second one, of course, is integrated planning and development, which is actually very nice to talk about. It's very tough to actually do it at city and metropolitan scale. And finally, of course, we have to revise our economic and financial models because what is really pushing us in the wrong space in the first place is, is the economic and financial development models. So the numbers are big. Fine. And like I said earlier, 
These cannot be supported by legacy aid mechanisms. I'm going to Canberra, I'll be talking to the DFAT guys, I've known them for a long time. Uh, this is not, even in, in, in sort of in the Pacific, this is a very small amount of resources compared to what we need to do. We have to think of other ways of actually mobilizing resources, uh, not only at, from the household level, but from enterprises, from long-term uh, capital, a whole range of processes. But remember, cities are adding, as I said, trillion and a half dollars a year. Look at the resource requirements that we're talking about. So that, that's added on incrementally each year. So the resources are there. The question is how to rejig the system to actually make it happen. So, you know, private flows will have to make up half of this. And of course, like I said earlier, global net savings is many times the investment required. But the basic challenge is a huge gap in the financial architecture at all levels. So we have to really start thinking about reworking the financial system. And of course, the way to do that, at least in, in my understanding of it from practice, is to build governance and institutional capacity at all these levels. And I think Australia has a lot to, to contribute in spite of, you know, I'm sure you have, you have more criticism of your processes than, than, than nice things to say about it. That's true of most countries of the world, but you have a lot, lot to teach the world. And we have to do this really quickly because, you know, we have 15 years to go. So basically, uh, and maybe this is something that you don't experience here, but if you come to other parts of the world, the viability of the imagination of the nation state is dependent on maintaining urban security peace and safety. This is not something that you can take for granted in many parts of the world, including the country that I come from. And inevitably, because the world is connected, these challenges will come to you. You know, both Brussels and Paris, I visited them a week after the things that happened over the last year. Uh, even, you know, whatever, cities in, in the largest countries or the most powerful countries in the world can be brought to their knees by a few people. I'm not saying that's the way we should go, but that's a re reality because cities concentrate opportunity they enable the economies of scale, the economies of scope, but they also concentrate risk. Whether it's climate risk, as far as you're concerned in terms of rainfall here, they also concentrate social and economic risk. They concentrate that, that's, that, that's, their, that's their power. They're both negative and positive concentrations. We often focus when we're dealing with cities on the positive side, we forget the negative side, and that's what good governance is about, understanding where the risks are and de-risking that. And you know, the examples are this, not so far from you. Okay, I mean, Hong Kong is going through lots of transitions. This, which I think one of the most important images, like the images from Sao Paulo, that actually pushed many of the member states of the UN to say, look, it's really important for us to do something about cities. I was in Sao Paulo just you know, a few weeks before the big protest started. Uh, but this is Tahrir Square. This is what, what, what you know, and, and you know what, what has not happened, let's say, in Egypt as far as that's concerned. And of course, in the worst case situation, which is what you're seeing just now in the newspaper, this is what's happening in Iraq. This is what the reality of ISIS is all about. I mean, and, and, and the reason I, I brought up Iraq is uh, the longest history of failed cities goes back 5,000 years. And if you've ever been into that landscape, you can see it. And this, ha this has happened again and again and again in history. We think in, 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 in two narrow terms. So I guess the question is, can local transformation be linked to a global urban transition? I'll just show you a, a sketch of how we're trying to do this in India. It's actually very complex, even analytically, and I'm showing it to you because many people in the room are, 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 are academic. Same, same kind of schema that I showed you earlier. This is the urban India, not all of India. I showed you India earlier. We were trying to map them, and we find that we have a lot of problems in terms of data, fine? Uh, so these are multiple goals, uh, all the indicators. That's, and, and the thing here is you have to look at changes over time. That's 2000, urban India. That's 2015. So you can see some improvements between in some areas especially um, around some, some goals dealing with technology and energy use. That is, this is a state that I come, that I, that I work in just now, Karnataka. So this is like looking at Western Australia. Uh, and then there's some changes that are there. But the most difficult one was the city that we live in because the data actually doesn't exist. Now, I guess in Australia, maybe may be better off. But we cannot build, and this is the big challenge that most urban researchers are facing at the moment, is to build a piecewise continuous process that links city to region to nation, and it's, it's, it's very difficult. We've been fighting this uh, in the UN, uh, in the UN Strat Commission now for the last year or so. National statistical systems are not designed to produce data at the local level. But today with crowdsourcing and with technology, we can actually do this very easily. And I guess my plea to, to academics and academic institutions across the, across the world is, take your city, work on it. It won't take you more than a couple of years with geospatial technology, with crowdsourcing, with your students to actually plot these processes out. Because if you're do, able to do that and look at how it will change over time, at least over the next 10 or 15 years, we'll have at least some sense of a roadmap of how this can be possible. So, and you can see here, this is, this is all about a deficit in terms of, of data, that, that's where we are. 
So to summarize, we have an urban goal, but the political process that we're involved with at the moment is taking back our connection with the other goals. The urban goal does not have water, it is not a health, it does not have energy inside it. We're taking back the other goals and saying, if you want to actually deliver these outcomes that we're talking about, local areas are where they will be delivered. And we have to bring back that process and build this framework that operates from the local, through the regional, to the global. And there are two core ideas which are new in some senses. The first idea of no one being left behind. This is a universal process and it doesn't matter how long the tail of that distribution is, but we are going to actually embrace the vulnerability, the difference, the people who have historically been left behind. And Australia knows what that means. But more than that, and this is really the insidious idea, is the idea that's, that's centered in goal 11 of no place being left behind. So it's one thing to say, no person will be left behind. It's a very different thing to say for those of us who are urbanists in, in this place, that no place will be left behind, not only in the country, and we're talking about uh, Aboriginal populations as far as, 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 as Australia is concerned, but even within the city, because we know that every city enshrines in its character degrees of inequality. Some countries do better than others because they have a statute of the city or X and Y and Z. Others don't, don't, don't do very well. So this is a new idea that we are struggling with trying to operationalize and integrate into this frame. And the entire paradigm is pushing back against it. So universal provision, not leaving anybody behind and not leaving any place behind. That actually sort of challenges us to build a very different frame. And you know, somebody asked me last evening, uh, is there any hope for this process? Is it just another piece of paper exercise? And I, I'll just give you two examples. So last year, quite by accident, I got invited to uh, help convene um, a meeting at the Vatican. And, you know, I've never met the Pope before. It's not been, you know, something that I've been to. We've all gone, gone to the Vatican and seen the galleries. But we actually had a remarkable opportunity uh, with Pope Francis and uh, something like 50 of the top mayors in the world. And it is because the Pope called, and he called for a very interesting reason. And people were actually quite confused. I remember uh, a mayor of a major uh, Brazilian city, you know, trying to reach us and said, why is the Pope called us for a meeting that has to do with sustainable cities and human slavery and migration? I mean, what, what have I done that is, that is asked <laughs> to, to call me into a meeting for Rome for this? I mean, it's a big thing, you know? Uh, Brazil has a lot of Roman Catholics and it's a great thing to be invited personally by the papal secretary to come. I mean, have, have, have you got the wrong cu country? Have you got the wrong city? The actual fact was he was making a very important point from his own experience, not only in, in Argentina, remember he was in, in Buenos Aires, but also in what was happening in Europe today, that these processes are fundamentally connected. And one of the wonderful things that he said, he spoke wonderfully, I mean, I mean you know, I, he was speaking from here and I was sitting somewhere there, was, uh, and he spoke in Spanish, he didn't speak in, 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 in Latin or Italian. Uh, he said, cities are the places where the people of the peripheries come from. The answer to these problems will come from the peripheries. Because the people at the center have a little interest in making the change. And he talked also about climate change at the same time, because you remember there was this encyclical that went out, where he said, look, this is not a green agenda that I'm talking about. It is not greenwash. It is fundamentally a moral question, and it is a social question. Climate is a social question, not an economic question, or um, a question of just the environment. So, and it was a remarkable meeting, because for the first time, and you know, there were, there were mayors from across the world, some of the most important mayors in the United States from all over. Um, the interesting thing that happened was, the mayors realized that they had more in common across the world in the challenges they dealt with, with the solutions that they were finding, than the differences that they had. So there was an electric feeling in the room, which basically said, look, we are actually solving problems, and this is my experience with local governments across the world. And I, this has been a journey for me over the last four or five years. And that is that when you talk of problems, national governments are very happy to tell you what the problems are like. But as soon as you talk to a set of mayors, within five minutes, they're talking about solutions, how they fix this, how they did that. And not all of them actually work, but they are focused on making a change. So it is really at the local level that you see this thing happening. But 
because of the structure of governance, because of the fact that we're fragmented across the world, we are unable to tell our stories. In front of me, literally, I, you know, there was a mayor of New York and the governor of California. California is like one of the largest countries in the world. They both, they both belong to the same party. They never met each other before. Uh, and they were discussing how, how they could implement climate initiatives. In fact, Jerry Brown said, look, he, he was the Calif governor of California in the 70s. He said he was telling the, the mayor of New York, look, I did this stuff 30 years ago. It's no problem. You can do it tomorrow morning. So th that kind of connection is really, really important. And that's what I was suggesting to colleagues from here, that the stories from Perth, from Melbourne, uh, from Sydney, from a whole range of Australian cities do need to get out, not only within Australia, that's obvious, but they do need to get out to other places in the world. Because the solidarity that that builds, the lessons that you can learn are remarkable. And cities do not compete with each other. This is a myth that has been pushed down on us by both corporate ideas and also the ideas of competition between nation states. Nation states may compete for national security, et cetera, but cities have no reason to compete. Yeah? And that's what we're finding in practice again and again and again. So what, what came out of this meeting was a very interesting convening last year, just the day before the SDG summit, we brought together Unfortunately, the mayor of Melbourne was not able to be here, he had to be here. We brought together some of the top, that's Jerry Brown here, yeah. Um, that's, that's, that's the, you can recognize Jeff was here. Uh, that's the mayor of New Orleans who spoke remarkably. This is on YouTube, you can see all of the stuff here. He talked about rebuilding New, New Orleans. And it was remarkable because he spoke about similar kind of processes to uh, the, the mayor of Bandarache. Yeah, you know what happened to Bandarache after the Indian Ocean tsunami. They were talking about almost the same experiences, even though culturally, geographically, they were com in completely separate environments, right? So I, I mean, th that's the final thing that I would say, that really the answer to a lot of these processes that we're talking about, and the reason that I have hope is because the answers exist. They exist with local government. The question is, how can we concentrate and focus that energy? How can we provide resources for that to happen? And how can we take that and scale it up step by step in a process Let's not be naive about it. A process that will be contested because there are established interests and certain paradigms that this will have to break, both politically, economically, and of course, in moral terms. So I'll close with that. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah, that, that's one of the things that are there, but they're also smaller places. Because, you know, the, the real changes in, in many parts of the world will not happen unless these smaller towns, the places that are in our country are between half a million to a million, actually change. And, and in, in their context, they may not need a metropolitan development authority. But in other regions where there are 30, 40, 50 million people or even 5 or 10 million people in some senses, you need that. I mean, just from my own personal experience, I, I found the relationship between Vancouver and, and, and sort of the larger region around it in, in British Columbia because I was involved in the 100-year plan. Interesting to look at. And the reason I'm saying it may be useful for you because it has the same common law kind of framework. So, you know, many things are quite similar. So they actually have a nested uh, kind of governance frame. And when they're dealing with water, they deal with it regionally. So they're balancing water resources across multiple towns and multiple water districts. And they're planning for that. You know, California has it a little bit, but they're confounded in a different way. Similarly about energy, when you're making the renewables transition, they have pump storage, they have hydro, plus they have wind. When you have to manage decentralized resources at a regional level, it becomes much easier to do that. But your politics and your governance has to, has to take on that imagination. I think partially sort of educating people how to do this. And in gov government, of course, the key thing is you need experience. If somebody's not actually being able to, you know, the, the, your first metro is going to struggle to try and set it up. But once you have people who've done that, then replicating those things, building out the processes is actually possible to do. So absolutely, you need that metropolitan or regional government thing because you can't think territorially uh, without that. Uh, and you certainly can't raise the capital without that. And a lot of this is about raising the capital. It's, it's there. It's looking for places to invest. But you can't get it there. You can't structure it. You can't bring it together. Uh, and, and you can't deliver the outcomes and the returns. And, and most important in, in the, in the, in the middle-income country context, you can't actually, you can't reduce the risk because the reason that the money doesn't actually flow is because the risks are seem to be too high. Very good. Okay. Right. There's the first question. Yeah, That's okay. the yeah, thank you for the very complex analysis that you've done. Um, on, on the water question, water is probably our most serious challenge, and I guess Perth is a classic example of that. The fluoride thing, um, well, 
in, in many parts of India and Bangladesh, we have serious problems of fluorosis. Uh, so nobody added it to the water supply. It came into the groundwater. It's a huge challenge, both technologically and otherwise, because people are too poor in some senses to afford the kind of wonderful re reverse osmosis technology that you have. I mean, we know the technical solutions, but they don't have the money to deal with it. Uh, to, to my mind, the, the heart of a lot of conflict that we're going to be seeing in the more densely populated parts of the world is going to be about, about water. Uh, part of it is because of the way that we look at water today. So while in most cities and most modern metropolises, we look at rationing and, and water efficiency using pricing mechanisms and it works in some cultures. But in other parts of the world, water has been seen as something that's been given to you as a right. Uh, and when those two paradigms conflict, you have serious issues that actually uh, that, that, that emerge. Because the culture tells you that this is something that I should have. If every, any person comes to your house, you're given water as the first gift that you, you're given. But on the other hand, you're saying you have to be efficient and you're going to use pricing mechanisms to deal with it. So there are often deep sort of cultural ca crashes on how you actually use it. The traditional methods of dealing with this thing are quite effective in the context, the cultural context in which they existed. Those contexts don't exist anymore. So this is a very tricky area, especially because we're going more and more towards the use of groundwater. And groundwater regulation, pretty much anywhere in the world, is a very, very tough thing to actually enable because it's, it's a common resource, in some cases it's a fossil resource. So this is something that we have to learn both technically and as a culture, that you have to literally try and make sure that first you conserve every drop of water that comes in. And then in, in, in sort of deference to our cultural traditions and I guess the Aboriginal traditions in, 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 in Australia, you have to make sure that there is enough water for other forms of life before you take it and you use it and in most cases pollute it beyond anything else. And that's, that's both a cultural tradition uh, and also something that we have to institutionalize into our, our urban systems because I'll give you a concrete example. We are now, under, uh, my, my colleagues and I are undertaking a large program in, in a water starved area in southern India where it's almost certain that we cannot use flush toilets. There are 35, 40 million people inside there. You can't use flush toilets because with climate change, there just will not be enough water to flush down the toilet. So this is an idea that came from Victoria and England and other parts. So you have to have other systems of dealing with it. But then the interesting question emerges. What do you do with the feces that, that are in a pit latrine or in, 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 a, in, a, in a septic tank after 10 years or five years when it actually fills up? In our context, uh, the untouchables are Dalit population, are people who actually deal with it. Nobody else touches that, that stuff. So it has a deep social and economic impact and context. So just by changing how you use the water to deal with waste in your household will change both the economic and other processes down, down the line. These are questions that we have to address because we're at the limit of fresh water use in many parts of the world. So I think in some, some cases people in India will say, fantastic, you're having a debate about, you know, Fluoride, fluoride, fluoride addition because somebody had done some research which showed that you didn't get dental caries because fluoride is available. But they're, they're very deep questions that, that have to be addressed, cultural, economic, and of course social. Because again, it comes back to this core question. How much is enough? Can you manage in an environment where you have, whatever, 200 mm, 300 mm, mm, mm of rainfall to water your garden uh, and have grass? That's, that's, that's an existential question, I guess, for some people. Their identity will be, will be, will be tied to that. Uh, so that's sort of uh, one, one core thing on that. Um, sorry, what? I, sorry. Population. Yes. So the population one is is a very tough question uh, because the unfortunate thing for much of the world today is two things. The first thing is we live a long, long, much longer. Our average life expectancies have gone up, and that I think is one of the most important parts of what the development process has given us. You know, in India, life expectancies went up from an average of 30 about 70 years ago and we're touching 70. So people are living a lot longer. And the second thing is, even if we stop reproducing at the current point of time, there are a lot of people who are already there. So mo most of the dynamics that we're talking about just now are of existing populations. We'll add more people. Um, I think the, you know, the experience that, 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 we've, that we've seen across much of the world is that population control per se doesn't work I mean, in India, we threw out a government in 1975, which tried to, to, to in, in, enforce this forcibly. Even China went through that in, interesting phase and they've just reversed the one, one child policy because it has demographic, demographic content. The thing that works most effectively is actually to address inequality and poverty. And centrally, at least in our cultures, 
to deal with two, two questions. The first question is dealing with, with, with education of women and the, and the sort of empowerment of women to make their own choices, both economically and uh, bo both economic and reproductive uh, sort of choices. And the second thing, which is deeply cultural and very difficult to, di difficult to address, is to address what we call the sun preference in our cultures. Uh, the sun preference is what drives in many cultures, I guess both in India and in East Asia, uh, the un disbalance in the demographics. If I show you the sex ratios in India, uh, and when that's combined with technology, which it, it, it deals with a very, very difficult thing. So this is a hard question, uh, partially because there's a moral question. People are there, and they're going to live a long time, and many of them, like us, are in the room. Uh, and many of them are actually poor and not very well educated. And the second question is, we have to be able to make the commitment. And if we had done it in India, for example, 40 or 50 years ago, I suspect we would have had 100 million less people uh, if we'd actually done this uh, some, some, time, some time ago. So the places that are going to go through the demographic transition, and this is the time to actually start. Uh, and you know, th there are no hard ways to do that. So you have to affect both, both social and cultural change. Uh, and that's, that's not easy. Easily addressed contest is how, how intergovernmental fiscal relations operates within a country. You know, how much of your taxes goes directly to national government? Do you have a GST or not? How does the taxation system work? And then how it devolves backwards. So one of the debates is, can you not leave a lot of taxation options open for local and regional governments to deal with? Now, there's a complexity in implementing that because they have to have the capacity to implement the taxation collection systems. The challenge, I mean, the opportunity today is that we have technology that enables us to do that. As you move towards cashless societies, increasingly, and you know, you're one that can actually move quite quickly to that, uh, you can actually enable a lot of these processes through electronic processes. Yeah, so that's, that's the first uh, thing. The second question, of course, uh, is international flows of capital. Uh, and that relates to how populations age and how much they save. If you take a country like South Africa, South Africa actually saves very little money. About, I think 30% or plus of its population effectively is on transfers. It has a remarkable, like Brazil, a remarkable uh, system of transfers where basically people are on, a large number of people are on the door, but their saving rate are very low. If your savings rates are low, it becomes almost impossible for you to finance, uh, forget about growth, even the transitions we're talking about. So the resources have to come from somewhere else. At the moment, the big mountain of cash is sitting between Hong Kong, Taiwan, and China, okay? I mean, and, and that, 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 that those resources are gonna look for places to invest in. The question for us, at least in the development community is, will those resources go to deal with the big American infrastructure deficit, which is in the multi-trillion dollars? I mean, people think that American airports and, and roadways are fine, they're actually in a very bad shape. They haven't invested in them for a long time, and that's an obviously low sovereign risk thing. Or they could go to other parts of the world that actually need desperately to provide water supply, sanitation, roads, and other infrastructure for, for growth and development and jobs in South Asia or in, or, or in Sub-Saharan Africa. So that will mean not only a rejigging of the local architecture, you know, can you, can you be able to finance, let's say, a light rail project in, in Kenya, for example? And there are many challenges in doing that because you can't structure the project, you can't actually reduce the risk, so the money is available, but by the time it actually gets into that location, it's so expensive that people can't afford to actually pay for it. So there has to be a rejigging of the global financial architecture. It's actually starting just now. The old agenda, the so-called Washington consensus, with the IMF and the World Bank at one end and a whole range of institutions centered around London and let's say New York as signifiers, uh, uh, the center of gravity of that system is changing. It almost changed to Tokyo maybe 15 years ago, but it's certainly moving to Asia. And I think that is the interesting opportunity for, for you know, uh, when, when, when the crash happened after the uh, tsunami in, 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 um, in Japan, uh, most of the traders who, who shortchanged that market were actually Australians. They stayed for an extra day, they sent their family back, but they actually shortchanged the market. So there's a great opportunity for, for you to actually participate in, in, in that process. But finally, I think the, the fundamental academic question is a little deeper. And that is, what do you actually privilege in terms of rates of interest? At the moment, financial capital, and this is Piketty's argument, financial capital is given the highest value in our schema of things. After financial capital comes physical capital, that's why you have manufacturing. After physical capital comes human capital. And that's why countries that are, that are rich in people are actually relatively poor. And finally, you have the returns on investment on natural capital. 
So it's, it's a differential between the rates, rates of return on these forms of capital that defines how your system actually operates. And that is a question that is now being re-examined within economics, within finance, uh, and of course will have to happen in, in national government. If your fundamental binding constraint here is water supply, and you don't internalize the cost of water supply, you will not have the financial returns that you have in the real estate. You know, Perth was the real estate capital of the world for a while. Uh, so that is, I think, is, is a deeper question. What we actually privilege, and the architectures sit on top of that system. And I think when we look at this larger framework, we're starting to question what is really important. Uh, is human capital more important than physical capital or financial capital? Can people who actually control capital markets, like stockbrokers, et cetera, et cetera, and this is what the 2008 crisis was about in some sense, in a moral sense, what do you actually value? Because it's, it's, it is your life that is represented in your savings, which then goes on to be able to create either an automobile culture or a consumption culture or a debt culture somewhere else. Uh, and unless we're able to start asking these questions, both theoretically and practically, we can't think of how these, these rejiggings can actually take place. And I think that's, that's a question of critical academics and, and people who think critically.